Hi everyone and welcome to MedSearch One. This is Chapter 26, Caring for Clients with Cardiac Arrhythmias. Now when it comes to interpreting an EKG, we need to start with the very basics. We have to know the components of an EKG reading. The diagram on the right is a diagram of a normal, healthy heartbeat. The components we need to get familiar with are P wave, P to R interval, QRS, ST, and T segment. These are the components that we need to get familiar with when it comes to interpreting an EKG. So when you look at a rhythm strip, you will look to see if you can find any or all of the components. So basic EKG interpretation um, consists of the following components. Now first we want to determine the rate and you're going to do that by looking at a six second strip. That's what you'll be given for NCLEX. That's what you'll be given on your test. It's going to be a six second strip. You're going to count the number of R waves there. Once you count that number, you multiply by 10 and that's the rate of your, of your rhythm. So for instance, if you have three R waves, you have a heart rate of 30. If you have seven R waves, you have a heart rate of 70. If you have um, 15 R waves, you have a rate of 150. It's that, that easy to calculate the rate of your rhythm. Next, you want to look at your P waves. Are P waves present? What's the rate of your P waves? What do they look like? Are they upward? Are they uh, rounded? Are they smooth? What do your P waves look like? Then next, you want to make sure that in front of every QRS that there is a P wave. So there should be a one-to-one -one relationship between the P wave and the QRS complex. Next we look at the QRS complex itself. So is it wide? So the normal uh, QRX, QRS complex is 0 0.06 to 0 0.12 seconds and you get that number by counting the number of small boxes. So you count the number of small boxes and that will give you um, and multiply by 0 0.04 and that will give you your the size of your QRS complex. Then you're going to look at your P to R interval. So from the beginning of your P wave to the beginning of the R wave you count the number of small boxes there to get your P to R interval. And then last is your R to R. So when we say R to R you're looking for regular or irregular. So do the R waves look consistently the same length apart from each other? If they are then that's going to be considered a regular rhythm. If the distance between the R waves is inconsistent, then that's considered irregular. So first we're going to talk about normal. Um, beginning with a normal sinus rhythm or sinus rhythm, those two terms are used interchangeably. So the characteristics of a normal sinus rhythm include a regular impulse originating in the SA node and with that impulse continuing to the AV node. There is a P wave and that's initiated um, with depolarization at the QRS complex and ending up at the T wave. So your normal rate is between 60 and 100 beats a minute so for each QRS you have a P wave. The R to R is regular and so that's what makes your normal sinus rhythm.
So sinus bradycardia or sinus brady is similar to your sinus rhythm. The only difference is the rate is less than 60 beats per minute. So less than 60, you have a P wave, you have a QRS complex, you have a regular R to R interval, regular P to R interval, you have a rate of less than 60, you now have sinus brady. Causes of sinus bradycardia can be healthy athletes, some heart disorders, increased intracranial pressure, hypothyroidism, ditch toxicity, and so you can have a really slow um, heart rate depending on the client's underlying condition. So some people are very healthy with a slow heart rate. Other people have a slow heart rate and that produces a low cardiac output so that can be dangerous for some people. So if you have someone who has a dangerously low heart rate, meaning that they are symptomatic they're showing signs of not tolerating that. Whether it's a low cardiac output, they're having a decreased level of consciousness, they're, they're really um, uh, having some difficulty as far as their alertness, um, they may even begin to slow their respirations. You may want to give them some atropine is what we give. We give that IV for a dangerously slow heart rate. So you kind of want to anticipate What's your action going to be with someone with a slow or very low heart rate that's having some severe symptoms that you need to correct quickly? Give them some atropine. So sinus tachycardia is very similar to your sinus rhythm and your sinus brady. You have a consistent P wave you have a normal consistent R to R uh, rhythm uh, it's going to be regular the only difference here is this heart rate is between 100 and 150 beats per minute now if you exercise you're going to expect that heart rate to to be elevated right if you have fear or anxiety or pain or fever that can be expected to have an elevated heart rate but if you have hemorrhage or shock or hypoxia, that's when you start to kind of get to a more dangerous underlying cause. So with that dangerous underlying cause, you need to make sure that you are um, initiating some safety measures. Make sure that the patient um, stands up or rises slowly so that they don't fall and injure themselves. Know that there's a possibility that with that dangerous underlying cause that the patient could have a decreased cardiac output so their blood pressure can drop and so the heart rate is increasing to compensate for that low blood pressure um, that's been caused by the underlying um, disease process such as hemorrhage or shock or hypoxia. So a PAC is an atrial conduction system that initiates early electrical impulse and um, is identified by an irregularity in an underlying rhythm. It's called a premature atrial contraction or a PAC. Causes can be caffeine, nicotine, um, some sympathetic nervous system stimulants some underlying heart disease, metabolic disorders, and hyperthyroidism. Now an SVT is a dysrhythmia in which the heart is beating dangerously high at greater than 150 beats per minute. So your SVT can be a dangerous rhythm for your client. The patient may have chest pain, they may have um, some angina, they may have some hypotension, that blood pressure is going to drop um, in relation to that heart beat, beating fast. They may have syncope, reduced renal output because of that reduced cardiac output because the heart rate is so high. Um, to treat that we're going to give some medication.
Um, adenosine is one of those medications that we give. There's a um, clip here or a video that you can link to on the PowerPoint um, where we do where adenosine cardioversion is done. Adenosine is given IV. Uh, you make sure that you have a good, good working IV. You flush that with some saline. Then you flush it with that adenosine as fast as you can push it into the patient. And then you follow that as quickly as you can with another dose of saline. You will then see the patient's heart stop momentarily and start back. The patient is going to feel that. They're going to feel lightheaded. They are going to feel themselves pass out. But that's how we treat the SVT. We're basically chemically restarting the heart into a normal rhythm. Does it work every time? Not always, but when it does, it's an excellent, excellent drug to give. So we're going to move from looking at our more normal complexes to some abnormal looking complexes. And we're going to start off now with atrial flutter. So atrial flutter is a disorder in which a single atrial impulse outside the SA node causes the atria to contract at an extremely rapid rate. The AV node conducts only some of the impulses to the ventricle. And this results in a ventricular rate slower than the atrial rate. That makes the sawtooth pattern on the heart monitor. So when you look at the um, EKG that's on this slide, you see you do not see a P wave. You see a lot of P waves because that's the atrial firing, but there are multiple P waves for that one QRS complex. That sawtooth pattern is called flutter waves or sawtooth pattern, and that is the hallmark or telltale sign of atrial flutter. So when you see that sawtooth or that flutter, that is atrial flutter. Now moving from atrial flutter to atrial fibrillation. With atrial fibrillation, there are multiple etopic foci that stimulate the atria to contract. The AV node is unable to transmit all of those impulses to the ventricles. And that results in a pattern of highly irregular ventricular contraction and thus an irregular pulse. So you're going to have an irregular pulse with someone with atrial fib. So when you're documenting the quality of someone's pulse, you can say it's irregular. Now when you look at this diagram or this EKG strip that we have here, you see, R, you see the R waves, but you see between the second and the third R wave, there's a length, a long period of time that makes it irregular. So this is a irregular heart rate, irregular rhythm. This is your atrial fibrillation. Now atrial fibrillation can form clots within the atria. That can lead to stroke. Emboli can enter the circulation and once that happens a stroke can happen because that in, that clot has formed in the atria, it breaks loose from the atria, and it travels in the body circulation and goes up to the brain, and that's what causes a stroke. That's why atrial fibrillation is something that has to be treated um, as soon as possible. That's why a lot of people will take those um, anticoagulant drugs for that atrial fib to prevent them from having those type of strokes from happening. But this is irregular. As you, when you look at it again, you do not see one P wave for every QRS. Instead, you see a lot of little bumpy waves in there. Well, that's not a consistent P wave. And then you see that the R to R is not regular. You have length, so that is irregular. So this is atrial fibrillation. <laughs> 
So because there are such lethal complications that are associated with the atrial fib, and I'm talking about a stroke, we want to treat that as quickly and as effectively as we can. So in doing so, we may want to do what's called a chemical cardioversion. And this is done by giving the patient some medication. Now in conjunction with the chemical cardioversion, we're going to have the client started on some type of heparin. Sometimes it's a heparin drip, sometimes it's sub-Q. It just depends on the physician's preference. So if we give the client heparin, we're going to have to do a heparin drip. Um, so be familiar with your heparin drip calculation. Once the heparin drip has run its course, or the doctor has decided that it's time to uh, change the patient over to something oral, we may put them on some Coumadin. Um, that's generally for clients who have persistent AFib. But with Coumadin, remember you're going to have to monitor for signs of bleeding. You're going to have to also check the INR before you give a next dose of Coumadin, especially in the hospital. Now the chemicals that we use are the medications that are most frequently used with your atrial fib can be amiodarone, Corvert, can also be um, Digitalis, can also be some Cardiazem, and we're going to give these medications IV to start with. So we're going to give them either in the form of a drip or we're going to give it in a series of doses over several hours to try to get that client into a regular rhythm. However, sometimes that does fail and we're not able to successfully chemically convert a client. Now depending on how well they're tolerating that irregular rhythm, the doctor may uh, decide to go ahead and do what's called an elective cardioversion. Now with an elective cardioversion, an electrical shock is going to be delivered. Um, because of that, a client is going to have to sign a consent. So a consent must be signed. Before you um, do the cardioversion, you have to make sure that you have all of your emergency uh, equipment available, your crash cart, your AMBU bag. You may need to notify you know, respiratory therapy, um, a, another nurse, someone who, could, who can help you during the procedure. Also know that you're going to have to sedate the patient. IV with either some Valium or Versed. Those are the two most common given. Um, Versed more so, but you're going to sedate that patient with, um, like I said, Valium or Versed ahead of time. So exactly what does the, car the cardioversion do? Well, it's an electrical current that's initiated on the R wave, and we do this by placing EKG leads on the patient's chest. And you'll hear it beep, 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 beep with every R complex. So whenever the R complex is caught, that's whenever the elective cardioversion is going to initiate the shock. So the electrical current completely depolarizes the entire myocardium with the goal of restoring the normal pacemaker of the heart. So that's the whole goal of that. Now during an elective cardioversion, we use much less electricity than a defibrillation. So with the electric, elective cardioversion, we're going to use 50 to 100 joules for our elective. For defibrillation, that requires more electricity, and we're going to use 200 to 360 with that one. Now know that whenever you are doing that cardioversion, um, that whenever you're getting ready to initiate that shock and you're charging that machine, you have to shout all clear. Everyone needs to step away from the bed. No one needs to be touching the bed or the patient during the electrical shock because whoever is touching the patient or the bed is going to receive an electrical shock as well. So we want to warn everyone ahead of time to step away from the bed. Now clients who may have some persistent um, atrial fib, like I said, they may have to be started on some anticoagulants such as uh, Coumadin uh, or, or Plavix or something like that for the long term once they leave uh, the facility or the hospital. And starting the client on some anticoagulant will uh, 
help reduce the risk of an emboli formation that's associated with the, the ineffective circulation caused by the atrial fib. So that's the point of having the Coumadin. So clients with um, atrial dysrhythmias um, and they're candidates for cardioversion. The goal of the cardioversion is to restore the normal pacemaker of the heart as well as normal conduction because that atrial fib is not delivering adequate conduction or adequate circulation throughout the body. That atria is quivering instead of pumping and, and squeezing. So that atria is kind of quivering and not pumping effectively. So a heart block, um, this is disorders in the conduction pathway that interfere with the transmission of impulses from the SA node through the AV node to the ventricles. We have first degree, second degree, and third degree AV blocks of what they're called. Third degree is also known as complete heart block. So with complete heart block, which is your third degree, the atrial impulse never gets through and the ventricles develop their own rhythm independent of the atrial rhythm. So the ventricular rate is really slow, like 30 or 40 beats, and the patient generally is very symptomatic with this. The treatment is a pacemaker, and you can put in a permanent or a temporary pacemaker, but that is your treatment for your uh, complete heart block is your pacemaker. Now you are not going to have to do heart block interpretation for your test, but you do need to know that the treatment for your third degree heart block will be a pacemaker. Now we've already talked about our atrial um, dysrhythmias. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the ventricular dysrhythmias. So we have PVC contractions, ventricular tachycardia, and ventricular fibrillation. So your PVCs are your premature ventricular contraction. This is when contraction of the ventricle occurs early and independently in the cardiac cycle before the SA node initiates the electrical impulse. So there's no P wave in front of this wide, bizarre looking QRS. Assessment findings, pallor, nervousness, sweating, faint, faintiness, fluttering in the chest, they have that fluttering sensation in the chest. Um, occasional PVCs can be harmless. They can be related to anxiety, stress, fatigue, alcohol withdrawal, tobacco use, um, caffeine, that kind of thing, but for the most part, having a few PVCs can be harmless. So sometimes there are incidences in which a few PVCs can be lethal. Um, they're no longer considered harmless. So whenever you, your patient begins to have PVCs, you as the nurse need to start really noticing that monitor. So when a client has six or more PVCs in a minute, that's when you need to start to take heed. Runs of bigeminy. Bigeminy is when every other beat is a PVC. A couplet is when you have two PVCs in a row. A run of PVCs is when we have three or more in a, in a row because then that's when you can begin to have that VTAC. Multifocal PVCs is when they originate from more than one like location. So look at the rhythm strip on the right. As you see, the PVC is a little is wider than the normal QRS. You see the normal QRS has a P wave, a normal QRS, and then you have a wide looking um, deflection downward. 
with a V over it. So that's your ventricular uh, rhythm, that's your PVC. So right here, these are all unifocal. When we say multifocal, you can have them pointing down or pointing up. So that go, they go in both directions. So that's what we talk about when we say multifocal or unifocal. So sometimes during the process, the heart's beating, um, that PVC falls on the R wave, and when that happens, you can have a run, uh, run on T phenomenon, and that leads to VTAC. So when you have uh, dangerous PVCs are occurring, the patient's having those runs of PVC and they're beginning to get uh, symptomatic, you're going to give them some lidocaine IV um, and then sometimes follow it with an infusion to help calm that heart down and calm those PVCs down to prevent that patient from going into VTAC. So ventricular tachycardia, or VTAC, is a single irritable focus in the ventricle that initiates and then continues the same repetitive pattern. The ventricles beat very fast, 150 to 250 beats per minute, and the cardiac output is decreased. A client experiencing VTAC may lose consciousness and become pulseless depending on how long the dysrhythmia is present. So you may see a complex on the monitor and that is just the electrical activity. But when they lose their pulse, they no longer have that muscular contraction. So ventricular tachycardia sometimes ends abruptly without intervention but often requires defibrillation and may progress to ventricular fibrillation. So ventricular fibrillation or V-fib as we can call it, um, those terms are used interchangeably. Uh, the rhythm of a dying heart uh, PVCs or ventricular tachycardia can uh, lead up to this. The ventricles do not contract effectively and there is no cardiac output. So your patient will not be conscious and they will not have a pulse. You have to begin CPR immediately and you have to defibrillate the patient immediately. So whenever you see uh, a client who has a potential for VTAC, uh, know that they can go into VFib, that it's going to be, you know, a lethal rhythm. So you need to make sure that you understand that that's a high risk um, of death once that happens. And once a client goes into VFib, it's hard to bring someone back from that. Um, ventricular fibrillation is um, sometimes called a rhythm of a dying heart. Um, it is a rhythm that needs attention first because there is no cardiac output um, and it is an indication of um, CPR and defibrillation is warranted immediately. Um, defibrillation is used to eliminate the ventricular dysrhythmia and hopefully put the heart back into a normal rhythm. That's what you hope to do with that defibrillation. You want to disrupt that ventricle from fibrillating like it is and get a normal complex back. So the best way to confirm or diagnose a cardiac dysrhythmia or arrhythmia is with a monitor strip or a 12 lead EKG. Some clients may even wear a Holter monitor or a 24-hour monitor at home, which will identify the dysrhythmia as well. We can also do what's called an EP study or an electrical physiology study. And this is where the doctor uh, reproduces the dysrhythmia by stimulating structures within the conduction pathway. And in doing so, can determine the best method to uh, treat the client. Sometimes it could include eradication of tissue in an area of the heart that's producing the dysrhythmia. Sometimes it could be um, changing up some medication or cardioversion. But we uh, determine uh, 
the treatment by doing the EP study. This is just a list of some of the more common um, antihistamine drugs that we use. Know that oftentimes, if the drugs are not effective, that we do do an uh, elective cardioversion um, when, in fact, some of those drugs do fail. Some other management options may be defibrillation. So if your client is having pulseless VTAC or VFib, you are going to defibrillate that client. There's no cardioversion with that. It's just straight defibrillation. Um, whenever the um, AED is charging up, you yell all clear before the button is depressed and the shock is delivered. Once again, you do not want to be touching the patient or the bed during the delivering of the shock, whether it's defibrillation or cardioversion. Now, some places have um, AEDs, which are great if you're familiar with using AEDs and you're at the mall or at a restaurant and there's one present, grab that AED, that's a life saving. Um, as you learned with your MI patients, greater than 50% of them drop dead from an, a, a lethal rhythm, and that's your VTAC or VFIP, so that's why you want to initiate that AED as quickly as possible. You also have what's called an automatic implanted cardioverter defibrillator, also known as AICD, that is internally planted into the patient like a pacemaker so the patient has it um, implanted it's an implanted device um, and whenever the patient has PVCs they have that run of VTAC that actually delivers uh, an electrical shock to the patient's heart internally so patients sometimes will get scared because they've been shocked by their device and that's what it's intended to do shock them um, and so they um, sometimes they'll just come to the hospital because they're just, just frightened because it just shock them and they're not really prepared for that. Lots of times we see those implanted with patients who have a tend tendency for those tachydysrhythmias such as those cardiomyopathy patients. Um, just about everyone that has cardiomyopathy once it begins to um, progress into the later stages everybody gets an AICD as well as a pacemaker so they may have a um, a dual device um, implanted with that, but the ASCD you see lots of times with that cardiomyopathy. And just like a pacemaker, um, a client cannot have an MRI if they have an AI, um, AICD. Um, they can safely use a microwave, but they cannot get into um, an MRI device. So you need to make sure that you do some patient teaching with that if they are discharged with an AICD. So as far as surgical management for a dysrhythmia, a pacemaker that provides an electrical stimulus to the heart muscle to treat that ineffective Brady dysrhythmia that's going on, say they have a complete heart block. Now there are different types of pacemaker you have demand um, and fixed rate pacemakers. You also have uh, temporary and permanent pacemakers. Now with the um, temporary pacemakers, you have transcutaneous, transvenous, and transthoracic pacemakers. Let me repeat that again. Transcutaneous, transvenous, and transthoracic pacemakers. Now your transthoracic pacemakers are um, used more commonly with your open heart surgery patients, but they are a um, temporary pacemaker as well. Some clients may need radiofrequency catheter ablation. So you may hear that term ablation. The client's going down to have an ablation. And this is what they're talking about. That catheter tip is heated up and it's t it, they touch it on that tissue where the dysrhythmia is occurring. So they want to um, kind of like fry or destroy that, that tissue that's causing the problem, that's causing the um, dysrhythmia. So they destroy that 
and air it tissue and they hope by doing that it allows the impulse of conduction to travel over to the appropriate pathways. That's the goal of that radio frequency ablation. Now complications can occur with the ablation. You can have bleeding, perforation, a thrombus, um, um, pericardial tamponade. That can also occur during the ablation process. So let's talk about what a pacemaker rhythm looks like. Um, on the left is a sample EKG of what a pacemaker rhythm may look like. And that characteristic of that very long thin spike is what that's called. It's a spike in front of that QRS. It's pretty consistent with a uh, permanent pacemaker. So this is the type of rhythm you may see on a client with a pacemaker. So whenever your client has a pacemaker inserted, just a few things that you're going to have to uh, talk to them or tell them, you know, as a nurse, they need to be careful with that incision and keep it dry for a couple of days until they return to the office. They may need to wear a sling on that arm, that affected side, to keep them from moving their arm above their head because um, you don't want that. Tell them to report any redness, swelling, fever, that kind of thing. Um, tell them that they um, cannot have an MRI or be around any large magnets like that, but they can use a cell phone, they can use a microwave without any problem. Um, just have to remind them to restrict that movement because um, you don't want those uh, pacemaker leads to become dislodged, so they may have a, a period of a few weeks to keep that arm as immobile as possible. And the doctor or the facility will have that written on, on those instructions to give the client. So this is an example of an asystole rhythm or an agonal rhythm, um, just depending on how you were taught and how you want to interpret it. So your agonal rhythm or your asystole is also called a flat line. So this is when you see this rhythm on your monitor. You need to uh, check the patient immediately um, because they could have easily pulled themselves off the monitor. They could have pulled off all of their leads and giving you this rhythm. So always check the patient first um, and then you can check your equipment. Sustained assistally um, results in death. Um, so um, it's something that if you go in and you see the straight line on your monitor, you go in and you check your patient and they're fine talking to you. They just pull themselves off the monitor. You just put the leads back on. However, if you go in and the patient is unresponsive, they don't have a pulse, you're going to call a code and you're going to start CPR immediately. So our nursing care for a client with dysrhythmias always make sure that before administering an antidysrhythmic medication that you're going to check that client's heart rate um, not so much the blood pressure as it is the heart rate. You're going to uh, check that, make sure that it has a rate of at least 60 or better before you administer that medication. Um, uh, that's kind of a golden rule right there. Anything less than 60, you may have to notify the physician. Uh, then the dosage may be changed or the medication may be stopped. Um, most common cause of dysrhythmias can be ischemic heart damage. Um, can be like an, an old MI or an MI that's happened. Um, when the heart does not obtain sufficient blood to meet demands of the heart, it works harder to circulate the body fluids and it can become ineffective in that process. So just know that with that dysrhythmia that the client is experiencing, you're going to have a decreased um, cardiac output. So that blood pressure may be lower they may be a little bit more wobbly when they stand up. Just be very mindful and um, be very on top of 
creating a safe environment for that clients with that dysrhythmia until it can get under control. And that's the type of client you don't want to leave alone. So someone with a dysrhythmia, you don't want to walk them to the bathroom and close the door and have them in the bathroom alone because they can code on the toilet. So be mindful, um, make good smart choices when it comes to a client with a uh, dysrhythmia on how you're going to proceed with your nursing care and what type of interventions you need to initiate um, should there be a complication with that dysrhythmia. Thank you everyone for taking the time to listen to Chapter 26, Caring for Clients with Cardiac Arrhythmias. And always remember, let your heart guide you. It whispers, so listen closely. Have a great day.